Welcome everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Karis Books, and Karis Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. I'm joined tonight by Julia McKenzie Munemo, who is the author of the book Cooper, um, a memoir of race, love, and legacy. I was like, I know there's one more word there. <laughs> um, we are um, going to have sort of a wide ranging conversation, but I've asked Julia to read a little bit from different parts of the book. But before she does that, I want to sort of orient y'all um, who are watching at home to the space. So you can, you're welcome to um, shout out where you're watching from in the chat. You can also at any point um, put in the ask a question area any questions you have. If you see a question that you like that someone else has already asked, you can upvote that question. Um, so no need to be redundant. At any point, you can click the um, teal button at the bottom center of the screen to buy the bookkeeper. Um, we know that after this event, you're definitely going to want to read the whole thing. Um, but we're going to be here to give you give you lots of, of good material tonight. And um, we really do appreciate your questions. So feel free to um, to to share at any point. It's not disruptive. And we'll, we'll start incorporating audience questions towards the end. But um, Julia, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, Thanks got, for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we got to chat a little bit at the very, uh, as we were sort of orienting ourselves to this medium. And um, so we we have in common that we both went to Bard College, which is featured uh, at, at the beginning of the book where you uh, meet your husband and fall in love, which is lovely. Um, <laughs> and you also um you know share share a a a legacy of um of many things that people in our community experience so um i am the uh, leader of the race conscious parenting collective which is a group that meets at Karis. and one of the things that we really focus on is how white parents particularly of children of color can be um, the strongest advocates for dismantling white supremacy within the family. And so whether folks who are watching from home um, are white and, and working on their own internalized white supremacy or are raising children at this moment, we hope that, you know, if that's part of what brings you here, you'll, you'll get some of that. But this book is about a lot of things. Um, and I actually, before you read, wanted to, to sort of ask you to just give us the the, the sort of scaffolding of the book uh, and then and then maybe go into your your first reading okay sure um, thanks er I um, so so the bookkeeper is a book whose sort of central irony is um, that I discovered years after my father died that he wrote interracial pornography specifically um, slavery porn which was not a subgenre I knew much about. It's not one I think very many people know about, but it it did exist in the 60s and 70s, um, less so in the 80s. And, um, and and ironic because my husband is black, my children are mixed race, and um, and so I I sort of structure the book around that fact, that central irony. Um, but as you said, it is a book about many things. So it's also about my father's mental illness and his suicide. Um, the legacy of mental illness also in my husband's family. Um, my husband is from Zimbabwe and there's mental illness on, on his father's side as well. Um, so it, it asks these questions about sort of what, what legacies we carry with us as parents, um, as, you know, just citizens, right? Not even specifically as parents, but I think we could probably talk tonight about, about parenthood for sure. Um, you know, and what we owe it to our children to share, what we owe it to our children to not keep secret so that we can dismantle all of the systems of oppression, be that through um, the shame, <coughs> excuse me, the shame that mental illness, I think, causes so many, um, and also the shame around racism, right? That, that white people have a hard time facing the racist legacies and, and so, so that, you know, and that's what I did in this book was I, I really tried to face all of those um, secrets and shames. Um, yeah. yeah. So sh should I should I start or do you have another? No, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with chapter one. Um, there's a tiny bit before this that just introduces my family. Um, 
but but I think you know you you know from what I just said about my family. Um, so chapter one. Late one night, the winter, our children are nine and twelve. I settle on the green couch in the den of our rural New England farmhouse, holding an old soft back book in shaking hands. Its title is The Wrath of Chain, and the teaser copy promises the most shocking portrayal of slavery ever written. But the image under those words reveals a tale as old as time. There's a tall, muscular black man trying to pull his wrists apart, but his chains don't allow it. He's got no shirt on and his pants are unbuttoned. A white woman in a yellow dress with carefully curled blonde hair clings to his arm and gazes up at his face. I keep looking at the author's name and trying to pull out a memory from the distance. I know it's one of my father's pseudonyms printed there on the cover of this thick piece of pulp, but I can't remember ever hearing it spoken out loud. Tonight, with my family sleeping upstairs, I open it for the first time. My father wrote this book, and I know very little about my father. Right away, I see the name of my mother's mother penciled in the right-hand corner of the first page. It's handwriting that brings back birthday cards and grocery lists, handwriting I haven't seen since childhood. My father's mother-in-law didn't just keep this book he wrote, she marked it as hers, laid claim to his work, even when it was slavery porn. Her tidy name in the corner of that brittle yellow page softens me to the book, softens me to my dad. It allows me to begin. The young black man sat for a long time within sight of the house of the overseer. It was almost morning when he first stirred, changing from a sitting to a kneeling position beneath a large cypress tree hung with Spanish moss like a shroud. I read. These are the first words of my writer fathers I've ever read. The chorus of spring stars was still loud in eulogy in the heavens, I read. Loud in eulogy. I run my eyes over the phrase again, there at the bottom of this first page. It's not so bad, I tell myself. I can do this. It's time to do this. But then there are torn clothes, there's a wide forehead, there's a thick chest. There is chain, speechless and superhumanly strong, a slave with sex appeal. His large black nostrils flared and his heart pumped fury through the veins Iwana had given him. The son of Iwana and the high medicine stood in the Louisiana night and felt a great pounding beneath his forehead and behind his eyes. He remembered the white woman who was asleep not 50 feet from where he stood and tasted the heavy saliva that was collecting on his tongue. When Chain finds that woman, her white fingers run over his coal black skin before he takes her head in his huge hand grasping it like a fruit to fling her to the ground by it. He is an animal, this man with a vaguely African sounding mother. He is an animal, this man in Louisiana where the high medicine made him and not a mortal father. I can't understand why this man is shown to be an animal in these opening pages. The white woman he's come for doesn't see yet that he's here to kill her. She thinks he's looking for something else. She lifted her nightdress up to her thighs and said, gonna get me some poison ivy like as not, but it's gonna be worth it, ain't it, you? And I have to close down a memory that threatens to rise up. A story about a woman my father had sex with in the woods one night, how she became covered in a rash from poison ivy afterwards, how he wasn't allergic to it. And I give my head a shake, remind myself why I'm here. Look back at the book. He knelt 
took her neck in one powerful hand and began to choke the amazed, half-naked, throbbing woman. Her eyes swelled in her head. A strange, small sound left her throat. And when he stood up, still holding her by the neck, she was dragged up with him. Her nightdress fell, covering her body again. She shook violently for a moment and then died, a foot off the ground, held in the powerful grip of the infuriated slave. At first, I sit dumbstruck and wonder what my tidy wasp of a grandmother thought when she read her son-in-law's words. How Joan Mackenzie from Albany, New York, felt about writing her name in that book after all. Then I wonder what it takes to dream up that violence. What parts of a person have to be accessible for him to reach in and find that. How the plot the author puts down on the page is informed by the contents of his heart. I think about my family sleeping above me and put the book down. I climb the stairs and creep into first one kid's room and then the others. I linger as long as I can, press my lips onto warm foreheads until their bodies shift and resettle. Stand in the hallway and listen to them breathe. Worry about what I've done opening this door, about what I will tell them when they ask where they come from, who their grandfather was. Then I climb into the bed I share with my husband and lie as still as possible. I don't want to wake him. I don't want to ask him to hold this truth with me. I don't want to burden him with these fears. I lie as still as possible in the bed I share with my husband and wonder how my father's imagination could have been so filled with racial stereotypes about couplings like my own. I lie as still as possible and think about how much I want to crawl out of my skin, out of my marriage from the guilt I feel. Because if this is who my father was, who am I? Thank you. So um, I want to start actually at the very beginning of the book with the epigraph because you quote Baldwin yeah. uh, and you quote, it's a very famous quote uh, from yeah. Down at the Cross. But what I loved is you you actually quote the whole paragraph instead of just the first sentence. So mm -hmm. um, so often uh, folks you know probably have heard the first sentence, which is love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. And that's on t-shirts, that's on like right. lithographs, all this stuff. But most people don't know the rest of that paragraph, which is what you quote. And it is, I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. And I thought that was such a lovely, way to to usher us into this book um because i think the the love that you are really interrogating all of the different kinds of love in this book are not are not um love as in happy right <laughs> not, not not this juvenile infantile love um that we're taught as the american dream but something much more complicated um right. and that starts a little bit with your parents story um that this was both of their second marriages that's right and um and was a little uneasy uh and then you know there are many other kinds of loving relationships that you kind of have to to sort out um but i also think you know thinking about love as a as an act of truth telling or uncovering right. and that that's that's both a gift that you give yourself throughout the book a gift that you try to give your husband, that you try to give your children. So I wondered, um, when did you choose your epigraph? And, and in a way, I think that I try to give my dad, right? And I think the last thing I read tonight will hopefully reveal that, right? But that even by the end, I, I didn't start there, but by the end, I definitely thought, okay, yeah, I, I, I also love him, right? And, and in, in, this, in this way, um, quest and daring and growth, it, it's not easy. Um, 
so when did I choose the epigraph? Um, I think I had a, a pretty close final draft. I knew what the book did um, when I when I sort of returned to the quote. Right, I I read it quite a long time ago, and then and then of course had had been reminded of it many times. Um, most recently, and I'm not going to quite remember where, but Claudia Rankin quoted it right in in something that I read right at that time. And it was a, such a good reminder, as as she always is, um, of of what Baldwin gave us, right? I mean, Claudia is a good reminder of many things, but one of the things that she reminded me at that time was was sort of that gift that Baldwin gave us. And and so yes, it it felt um, it felt like a quest when I went on this journey to write this book. Um, and I think it's so important to define love more broadly. I think that there is this sort of mamby-pamby American idea that we find love and everything is happy and roses. Um, and, and we're raised really to believe that. And um, I'm lucky enough to be married to someone who wasn't raised here and doesn't think that's the definition of love. Um, and that is challenging at times and also you know, so much more expansive. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I came to it pretty late in my process. Is my long answer conflict averse version of love, right? The the American version of love that yeah. doesn't really allow people to grow over time, and it doesn't allow people to be messy, um, right? And hard, you know. And I think right. um, so much of this book is, you know, and particularly in regards to your father, but even towards your mother and your grandmother, mm -hmm. um, it's like allowing people to really be themselves, even when that's really painful. Um, and sort of meeting them where you can and deciding yeah. when you can't meet them there too, you know, yeah. uh, which I really appreciated. And one of the scenes um, pretty early in the book that I really resonated with is the scene at your wedding where your mother, you kind of reach out to your mother and say, um, do you have anything you want to tell me? You're about to get married. Mm -hmm. You're about to embark on this moment. And you kind of ask her for affirmation Mm -hmm. and he says, well, I want to make sure you know that you don't have to do this, mm -hmm. which is, I, I, I really <laughs> felt it because it's totally something that my mother would say to me. <laughs> um, you know, it's a very, but I, I thought a lot about it. Yeah. I feel like slowed down in reading because at first it's just a total kick in the gut because you're like, I would imagine anyway, I experienced <laughs> it as a kick in the gut in the gut because it's not the kind of thing you want your mother to tell you as you are about to embark in this very significant moment that's already fraught for lots of reasons. But in in the little bits that we know about your mother, and I'm hoping you'll say more in a minute, um, yeah. it did feel like a, a real gift coming from her. Absolutely, that's what, what I was gonna say. Yeah, like yeah. It, she really seems to be A, a serious truth teller, and B, right. somebody who really believes in autonomy and freedom for people. That's right. And so she was like, what I need you to hear is like, don't do something that you don't absolutely want to do. And I wish that's right. Would do that. And so I thought that was actually this really lovely moment because I think, you know, with perspective, I can imagine you really valuing that, but I could also imagine in the moment that being really hard. Right. And I think my job in writing that scene was to give you that kick in the gut, right? Because that's that is how it felt in the moment. But indeed, in hindsight, what it gave me was um, the independence and autonomy I needed to make. I I was making a choice. Nobody else was telling me. Um, you know, not Ngoni, not her. Nobody else was saying that I had to do it. Um, you know, it reminds me of when I was feeling anxious about going to Bard as a you know as a recently graduated high school student, and she said nothing is set in stone. If you don't like it, you can transfer. And I thought, you know, at first I thought, well, what are you trying to say? Is Bard not going to be right for me? And then I thought, oh, I am, I get, I get to choose, right? And so it was a similar moment. Um, you know, the Bard one is less pertinent to the story of the book, but it speaks to my mother's willingness to just say, life can be messy. Um, and you you have what you need to figure that out. So make choices informed by that. Um, yeah, I think that is a real gift. And I think particularly yeah. for 
I'm, I imagine that our mothers are around the same age, like, you know, relatively early second wave feminists. Yeah. I don't know if your mom would label herself that, but she certainly behaves like a feminist. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, that, that real value of like, no, you, nobody told me that I could do this and you need to know feels really important. And, and even your, um, insistence on telling the truth about what happens with your dad yeah. um, and telling the truth about the fact that they were both married before. Cause I think that yeah. that's sort of a, at the time, you know, often people just sort of sweep their previous marriages under the rug, right. and yeah. act like marriage is this really sacred, magical thing. And yeah. it seems like your mom really chose not to do that in, in a health, to me, a healthy way. Oh, for sure. And, you know, so I was recently interviewed on Danny Shapiro's podcast for Family Secrets, and I was trying to explain to her that, like, and, and only am I coming to this right now, but the fact is, the secret keeper in the family was me, right? I'm the one who found the books and hid them in a closet. They were never a secret. My mother didn't keep them secret from us. Um, there was a time after which they weren't around, but, but you know, much like my father's suicide, much like his illness, these were these were facts. You know, their their first marriages. Um, these were facts that we knew, and so the definition of secret in my family was really different. Um, so yeah, for sure, truth teller, and uh, yeah, sort of therefore, someone who who helps you go go into the world bold enough to make your own decisions. So I wonder if you could contrast your mother a little bit with your father's mother who you mm. have a very sad moment with yeah. you go to tell her that you're marrying and goni and she um she has a really racist reaction and a really sad reaction um yeah. and that really severs the the intimacy of your tie for the rest of your life i mean it severs our tie period for a number of years right so so I, I went to her to tell her that I was getting married and um, and she freaked out and told me that if I married him um, to never come back to her. And um, you know the, the details of that are, are in the book, but um, the, the result was that I didn't, I didn't see her again. And for many years, I was pregnant with Julius, which was probably six or seven years later. Um, when I reached out to her again and, and she picked up the phone. Um, but our relationship was never the same. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, it had never been good, but it was never intimate again. Um, and indeed she was a secret keeper. She, um, she wanted my mother to tell us that our father had had a heart attack, not that he had committed suicide. Um, I didn't know any of her sort of she, she herself was not a Holocaust survivor, but members of her family were. And that was a story I, I didn't know until her daughter told it to me many years later. Um, so she she wanted to cover up anything that was ugly or um, didn't go along with the narrative that she envisioned for herself. Um, so yes, a secret keeper and um, someone you know filled with lots of uh, animosity and racism. I thought a lot about um, Esther Perel when I was reading yeah. the section and, and her talking about her parents who are both Holocaust yeah. survivors and about how people tended to go in one direction or another after yeah. the war, like either yeah. they became vibrant and joyful and just like right. living life to the fullest or really became small. Yeah. And he kind of never knew which way people were gonna go. Um, or, or, or Victor Frankl too, like somebody like similarly, like, do you, do you make a, um, a sort of mansion of survival in your mind, even if you yeah. can't do it, which I think has resonances with your father as yep. well, um, yeah. or, or do you just really shrink and shrink and shrink? And it seems yeah. like your grandmother, unfortunately, right. would shrink. And I think that, right. has, that has real implications for all of us who are trying to, you know what? What at, at Karis, what we talk about is we are going to be more creative and more generative than the people who seek to oppress us, and that's how we're going to win, yeah. right? And I think yeah. that 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 is that that in this book that is so much about language and imagination. Also, that really is part of what you're interrogating is like, where are these ideas coming from, right? With yeah. your father, like, and and how are there any 
places in these stories that actually are creative or valuable or generative or were they in some psychological way for your father helpful to him mm -hmm. even if or did he hope they would be and and they led him astray right these are questions i ask yeah, yeah i think that's such an interesting question and it's it's a valuable question to ask even because i think sometimes a knee-jerk reaction can be and certainly it was your reaction initially was to just be like this is trash fuck this <laughs> like right. fuck you right. like, you know which I think right is, I think that's also often our first response as white people is to be like i can't see any of this and so i'm just going to be right. you know right. and that seemed to be your first sort of reaction to finding these books and being like i'm just mad yeah I'm just like i can't even read this and then yeah. being like so what's under this and what's under this and what's under this and so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of that process of excavation yeah. it it really was a years long Absolutely, yeah. So the scene that I just read, um, it's the first chapter in the book, but it it's it's not, you know, sort of the first thing that happens chronologically. Um, so at that point, the books had been hidden and I had hidden the books in a closet um, where they had been for 10 years. So I had known on some level, right? I had probably known on some level my entire life, but I had known on this very specific level, I had these four books in, in a box in my closet. Um, that there was a history that I was unwilling to look at. And um, I was unwilling to look at it for all those reasons, right? It, it, I was angry. I felt the sense, this sort of strange sense of like um, betrayal, which makes no sense, right? Because my father wrote these books, some of them before I was born. Um, but this sense of, you know, I, I don't need to know who that guy was. That's no family of mine. Um, it wasn't until, uh, it wasn't until 2014 um, that I sort of woke up to my need to accept my own legacy and to understand and really reckon with my my race as a white woman um, and as the mother of black children. So uh, as we will all remember in, in November of that year, Tamir Rice, who was a 12 year old boy was killed by the police. Um, my eldest son, Julius was about to turn 12 when that happened. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm both embarrassed and ashamed to tell you that it took me 12 years of being the mother of a black child to come to this, but it, it, um, Tamir Rice's murder really woke me up to, um, what it meant to hide from my legacy as a white person in the, in the country, but also in my house. Um, and, and as a, as a mother, right? Hiding my whiteness wasn't getting me anywhere as, as a mom. I needed to really face it in order to ask them to sort of grow up in this country and go into the world and figure out who they are. Um, so that's when I, that's when I pulled the books out of the closet um, and began what you call an, an excavation. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was years, it was years long, right? So that was in 2014. I had on some level been writing the story of my father's illness and death for some years before that, but not in the form of this book. Um, it wasn't until I sort of had the structure of his career and, and the books of his that I that I finally resolved to read and this quest to to really understand myself and and really love myself for all of my own messiness and missteps, um, as we were talking about it with the epigraph, right? Um, so it wasn't until then that, that I began the sort of more in-depth excavation of my own self and my own complicity, um, yeah, in this, in this country and, and in this house. So that's interesting that it started, the work started more around his mental health and his death. And then yeah, I mean that's that dates back to high school, right? I've been trying to understand that for a long time. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think anytime any of us suffers that that kind of loss, it's you know that's that's yeah. like your your origin story, right? It's right. like well, why, why did this happen in my family, and, and can it happen again? Right. Yeah. Um, and then I think of course that becomes even more significant um, when you have children, right? Um, and so I think so. You also um, you 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 moved to Zimbabwe, 
um, and and live with Ngoni's um, parents or grandparents who are like his, his parents um, who raised him and his uncle who has some mental health issues. And um, this sort of brings to the surface when Julius is a little baby, like this yeah. brings to the surface all of these things around your own family and about, you know, genetics and what is, you know, what is, what is, you know, written on the body. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I think works so well in this book is so much of what we consider um, mental health is socially constructed or has its own cultural context. And you yeah. really talk about that in terms of how uh, Ngoni's family responds to his father's illness before you get there and his uncle, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. obviously race is all a social construct, but it has mm -hmm. all of these things have very real material consequences. Right. And so um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of those parallel themes in the book and how you, you wove those together. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I started to see it as sort of um, two, like a train track, right? With two, whatever those are called, right? Not the ties, but the long ones. The rails. Um, <laughs> the rails. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, I was, that I was going down these two paths to try to understand um, the legacy that my children would inherit from their grandfathers and the legacy that my children would inherit from um, from us, right? From, from both both Ngoni and me, but um, you know the sort of racial legacies. And um, I'm not sure I even really have an answer to your question, except to say um, that structure sort of allowed me to, um, yeah, to sort of stay within some kind of boundary, right? So when I was on the thread about mental health, I could sort of focus in on that. When I was on the thread about race, I could focus in on that. And it, and it wasn't until I had done that for a fairly long time that I started to see places where they might come together. Um, so somewhat late in the book, I read one of my father's um, slavers, uh, as they were called, um, that's set entirely in Africa. And it is, um, it's uh, it's unusual. Africa was a place my father had not. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was a place he had not been. Um, and this book is set entirely in Congo. And um, and I I just I I I was sort of focusing in on that, right? Like as someone who has lived in Zimbabwe, not Congo, but you know I have I have some sense of some of the things on this continent. Um, you know, let let me sort of analyze my dad's. Uh, suggestion that he could write this with any kind of authority. And it was as I was digging into that, that I started to realize there were connections in what he was writing about his own mental health. And I realized that there was a suicide in every book, right? There were, there were hangings in every book, often multiple ones. Um, and there was this sort of search for the North Star, right? His, his protagonists who were enslaved men um, were always seeking um, direction and and um, sort of certainty, right? Trying to trying to find their way. They were lost. And many, you know, quite often because they had been stolen. So how could they know where they were? Um, and that was when I started to realize that at least I think, you know, I, I will never know, but at least I think that perhaps my father chose slavery as his trope um, because it, it gave him an opportunity to think about what happens to our bodies when there is trauma and can that sometimes lead to mental health questions. Um, and I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I, I talk about this in the book. I, I don't, I don't give him a pass for that. I don't say, well, you know, therefore it was fine that he did that. I, I think it's that in and of itself is a pretty racist idea that he could um, sort of depend on the institution of slavery to, to ask his own sort of white boy question. Um, but but I think I do think that that was one of the things that he was seeking was, you know, can physical trauma or epigenetic trauma um, lead to mental health challenges? I think he I think he wondered that. Um, and so I think he explored that in his work. So then at, at some point, I sort of 
the, the, the rails sort of come together a little bit and I try to twist them um, together as much as I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it works and I think it's really interesting. I think it's a question that more and more people in all of our communities are asking, right? Is like, yeah. what, is, what is written on my body? What are my legacies? And I think for those of us who are white, for people who are white and Jewish have, have a very specific epigenetic legacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then people who are white and not Jewish, you know, who have potentially a, a legacy of, you know, violence and terrorism and, and you know, a very different relationship to white supremacy. Um, you know, what is that? What is what is in our in our genes? You know, I think we really yeah. don't know. Um, I think we're just just beginning to uncover those um, physiological ideas. Um, yeah. And I think some people feel really hopeful that knowing those things can lead to healing. And some people feel really terrified by that idea, right? right? Um, I think the same, I think what I saw in terms of the parallel tracks is the same can be true for knowing about family legacies of mental health problems, right? right. And being like, okay, so if, um, you know, there's, I have similar, many, many people have killed themselves in my family. Many people have, you know, alcohol and drug addiction, many people who had um, schizophrenia in my family. And so it's that thing of like, do you feel better that you know? Do you feel, is there a comfort in knowing? Or is, would you prefer not to know? Do you make a calculated risk around choosing to have children biologically? You know, all those questions I think yep. are really interesting. And I think, you know, the question of nature versus nurture is something that, that, you know, it's like, if we're only relying on nurture, we live in the in the United States anyway, in a very sick society, right? And we know that. So mm -hmm. it's very scary as a parent, and particularly for you as a parent of black boys, yeah. to say, okay, well, I'm going to trust nurture because it's not just what happens in your own home, right? Right. Not, right. Absolutely. And you, that's what you're reckoning with after the murder of Tamir Rice. It's like, oh, it is. This is the the entire nurture situation is that the the lady who's the police officer at their school who who might be just fine or might kill them I know like, right you don't right. you don't know and every time your child walks right. out of the house that's a terrifying prospect so it's like even if you i guess the the thing that this is not really a question but more just an appreciation that i think you know that that these parallel things of like you never know what bullet you have no control over dodging any of these bullets really that's right that's right. And I think the only thing I would add is, you know, my my grandmother, my father's mother, hoped that if she didn't tell any of the stories about the trauma, we would just all go on and everything would be fine. Right. And so I was sort of raised um, and so, you know, I remember her sitting me down and saying so many bad things have already happened to you. you nothing else will ever like you'll be good now. Everything will be fine. And I remember knowing that that was flawed logic, even as a child, but being also really entranced by that idea. Like, oh, okay, my dad killed himself, so I've got a golden ticket. The rest of my life should be smooth sailing. Um, and it, was it in part that the naivete that that sort of engenders that allowed me to, to say, when, you know, when I fell in love with Ngoni, like, oh, we'll be fine. Just, you know, both our dads were mentally ill. Our kids will be fine. We love each other. Everything's going to be fine, right? And thank God we did because we have these amazing children and we, you know, love each other and our, we have this marriage and this home. So thank God. But was it in part um, sort of allowed to happen because I had this idea that, um, that from someone who kept all these secrets, that if we just didn't pay attention to it, it, it wouldn't affect us. And so I think I had to, that was part of the excavation was accepting that, okay, now I, I have this life and I love it and I'm so grateful for it. And also if I keep these secrets any longer, it could destroy them. ER, did we lose you? No, no, no. Can you still see me? <laughs> no, I can't. Maybe everyone else can. Um, um, you can but I'm glad that I can hear you, yes. Um, well, this is a good time for you to potentially read the next section. Sure, yes. I'd be happy to. <clears throat> so I'm going to read now from, from the middle of the book. Chapter 26. One early fall afternoon, 
I hear the kids laughing as they walk up the driveway from the bus. The windows are open to the warm air and their laughter and the dog's bark it inspires is my signal to get up and put the wrath of chain in the closet. I'm almost done with this trilogy, finally. It takes eons to read it because I stop for weeks at a time to protect myself a little, give myself breaks from the violence and the shame and the hatred my father put down on these pages. But I'm in the last chapter of the final book now. And when I hear the kids, I just don't move. I just let them walk in the den and see me sitting on the couch with that thing in my lap. They're loud and hungry and their scent is sour and sharp and warm. And it quiets my anxiety just to have them in my sight line again. I haven't smiled since they left this morning. They report on the lockdown drill at school and their homework assignments and the playdates they want me to arrange for the weekend. I know their buzzing is about to launch them into the other room and their own activities. So before they leave, I say, boys, sit down a minute. There's something I need to show you. Sometimes when I have to do the hardest things with them, I find I can do it better if I don't plan it. If I just start talking, it's as though some other person takes over and the words that come out are either right or they're wrong. They will either help or they will damage, but the words come out. If I'd tried to script it, the words would never come out. It's equal measures exhilarating and terrifying. What I say this time is, I've been reading the books your grandfather wrote. You'll see them lying around, and I want to warn you that the covers are gross. I pick up the book from my lap and lift it so they can see. They are yucky and sexual and racialized, and they might make you feel weird to look at. I watch their faces to see if the book makes them feel weird to look at. But neither of my children seems surprised or particularly interested. For them, a black man and a white woman standing arm in arm looks a little bit like the sidelines of a soccer game or our kitchen when one of them is telling a long story. Maybe they don't see the chains on Chain's wrists. Maybe they don't notice the look in his lover's eye or see the nuance in their different postures. Or maybe they are more able than I am to file that under a category that doesn't matter to accept that these books have nothing to do with them. I'm reading these books because they might help me understand who my father was, I continue, though I can see they're getting bored. And I just want you to know that if you have questions about any of this, you can ask me anything. My kids are accustomed to my lengthy explanations of things they didn't ask to know. So when they think I'm done talking, they just look glad this one didn't last so long. A part of me hopes that one of them will come over and hug me and tell me it's going to be okay, but I know that isn't their job. A part of me, one I'll never let them see, wishes they would stay here with me. I'm braver when they're around. Okay, mom, they say in unison, getting up. Can I have a snack? Julius asks as George heads out the kitchen door with his cleats in hand, and that's it. They don't ask any questions or show any signs of damage. They just want a snack and a soccer ball. So I set Chain aside and get up too, to get them those things. A few weeks later, George comes home from school and reports that today was the annual book sale. They had a whole room of used books. We could just take them for free, he says. I smile and ask if he got anything. No, he says, disappointed. I looked through all the used books for you, Mom, but I couldn't find any by Norman Gant. A laugh bursts out of my mouth, and I hug him and plan to tell Ngoni this story tonight because I know we'll laugh together about this child who is so sweet and caring and warm and open to this world, and because it's funny that our 10-year-old went to school today and looked for my father's porn in those piles. But after we laugh about it, 
I can't sleep thinking about the damage I've done. I have normalized slavery porn to the extent that my son thinks he might find it at a children's book sale. I have normalized slavery porn that my father wrote, not conveyed my disgust in the racism and misogyny he expressed in those pages, or my fears about where I come from, or my scorn about what his work says about the country we live in. In my attempts to help the kids not see what I'm doing as scary, scarring, to help them think of it as something any mom might do, I've made it unremarkable. But if it's unremarkable, how will they contextualize the harm my legacy has done? How will they understand that books like these prey on stereotypes about bodies like theirs and that those stereotypes need to be destroyed? Because of course, I want them to question this world. I want to teach them that it's our job to question this world, to try like hell to fix this world. I want to show them that what I'm doing isn't as simple as reading the books my father wrote so I can understand who he was. That what I'm doing is shining a light on a taboo that tarnished my childhood, that has tarnished this country in order to make what's underneath it fallible. Because if we don't talk about it, it holds so much power. If we don't talk about it, it becomes just another American monument to slavery. And I can't have that in my house. So I normalized slavery porn because it isn't unique at all. But that doesn't make it safe. Perhaps the realization that something can be both unremarkable and harmful. The cop on the side of the road I don't blink at but who carries a murder weapon in his holster is what I should most fear. So no, it's not as simple as I made it sound to them, but I've made it sound simple to protect them. I'm their mom. All I ever want is to protect them. I'm not just reading their grandfather's books to understand who he was. I'm examining my complicity in this treasonous history we call America and it's excruciating. So that's my favorite part of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you just say a little bit about um, sort of what that, what that process of, of writing that part was like and what you hope readers will take from it? Um, oh, it's hard to talk about the process of writing it. Some of it, um, you know, some scenes I remember exactly where I was when I sat and wrote them. And some of them um, sort of flowed out of me without, without much um, preamble or planning. Obviously I went in and, and revised and edited, but um, you know, I think I, by the time I wrote this section, I was just, focusing on being as honest as I could about, about my, um, my complicity, my, uh, the things that I had been ignoring for a long time. And, um, you know, just focusing on, on that love for my kids. That is sort of, um, you know, the main thing of, of the whole book. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there was a question in there that I'm not getting to PR, but, um, it was hard. It was a hard. It was a hard one to write, to admit both that that um, it was funny when when my younger son came home and and told me that, and also heartbreaking, right? And I think I'm I was so used to. You might hear my dog snoring in the background. Sorry about that. Um, I was so used to that part where we can just sort of stop when it's funny, right? Um, but then exploring what is underneath that, exploring that, um, that, you know, the part of me that thinks it's funny has some work to do, has some excavating to do, because there's so much more underneath um, what my son was trying to do in that moment, you know, even though he was 10 and, and didn't necessarily 
have an awareness of, of what I think he was trying to do. Um, yeah, so it was tough. It's, and it's a tough section to read, but it's, it's also one of my, one of my favorites. Well, what I really appreciated is I think so often um, parents feel this deep anxiety around telling children the truth about hard things and particularly the truth about racism. And so often we get amped up and, you know, our, our anxiety is so high and then yeah. um, kids are like, all right, you know, their, their, their awareness of it, you know, shifts from day to day and their experience of it shifts from day to day. And um, the, the pathos of it shifts from moment to moment, you know, and um, and that scene really embodies that, right? It's like, it's like I think I think often white people, we're we're raised in the United States, especially to treat race like, well, sort of like having the birds and the bees talk. Like you just talk about it one time, <laughs> when you're in a room, and then you're done, right? And right. so often, uh, you know. Our, our problem, I think, uh, in this country is that white people are taught that and children of color are taught from birth, like, no, this is, we're going to talk about this organically for the rest of your life. And so, right. um, you know, when you are a white parent of uh, children of color, you, you have to sort of discard your upbringing and your way of thinking about race and talking about race to meet the reality of your children's lives. And I think this right. is, the scene is so beautiful because it really is, it's it's that moment where those things meld where where you you know you have to sort of both you know meet them where they're at and also recognize like yeah this isn't as anxiety provoking for them in this particular moment because they are already right, right? but um, well because it's their it's their reality in a way that and i you know i think and this is i think what you're getting at too er is um white people don't have very much experience or practice talking about race, certainly talking about their own race, um, but really talking about race at all. And um, and so we're so worried we're gonna fuck it up. We're so worried we're gonna say the wrong word or, um, you know, which I, I, you know, I, I, I hope I reveal in here, I do, right? Um, but that, but that, what matters is having the conversation, right? Not being, not letting the anxiety about the conversation be the thing that that governs it, because then we're expressing um, the shame that we've been raised with, right? That this is something not to talk about. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, you know your your sort of journey. One of the things that I really appreciate about this book is the way that. It, you really show us your habits of mind throughout the journey mm -hmm. of excavating your dad's work. And, you know, this, you start very much from a, a very writerly place with his work. You know, you really are looking at his word choice and you're looking at, you're starting yeah. very intellectually, right? And your, your emotional response when you have one is just anger and sort of pushing away. And right. yeah. to me, it was very recognizable, right? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is something that I think most white people know, right? Is this very yeah. intellectual sort of distancing technique, right? And it's very, um, you know, it's it's a thing that I think most white people, we really struggle to even see it when we're doing it in the moment. Like often we can mm -hmm. come back from it and be like, oh, right, that's what happened. But it's right. like, that's so much of white culture a lot of the time is to start very up in the head and then yeah. dig lower and lower. And that's really what I observed about your your practice with your dad was really being like, okay, I'm going to start here and I'm going to really study how he puts paragraphs together and really how he draws characterizations. And, you know, obviously mm -hmm. that's your training as a writer and is this point of connection between you. But but then there was, you, you really had to go deeper and deeper. And so I wondered, you know, obviously in the finished product of this book, you're able to to show us that, but I wondered in the moment, you know, so when did you start to realize, oh, that's what I'm doing? Oh God, when um, uh, a, a very respected um, friend read it and said, oh, uh, are, are you staying at an emotional reserve on purpose? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, so a lot of, it, I think, you know, you talk about a kind of intellectual training also, um, for me, it, it's sort of a, a a personal training, right? So, um, truth teller that she was, my mom also was um, 
you know, someone who sort of the, the, the intellect was supreme. Um, and, and so talking about things that were emotionally difficult was not something that I, I saw modeled. We definitely knew the facts, but we didn't really excavate them. Um, and so I didn't know how to do that, right? And so I, I wrote several drafts of this book um, and had had friends and, and, and colleagues read, um, and, you know, and some of that feedback was, you know, uh, you're, you're not really getting at the complexities of this enough. And some of that feedback was, you are staying at an emotional reserve. Um, and so I, ha I, had to, I had to look at myself and say, oh, right, complexity is messy and I don't like mess and emotional reserve is what I know and, and, and find ways to dig into that. And so this, the scene that I just read is, was an example of me trying very hard to be um, as present in the moment with, with all of the complexity and all of the emotion um, as, as I could. And, um, you know, my hunch is that when my kids go to therapy and, and talk about their mom, they will also discuss her emotional reserve, right? Um, it, it's very possible that they will remember these things quite differently and that I did sort of the emotional work up here in my office. Um, but, but I, you know, I'm glad I got it on the, on the page where they can, they can at least read it if, if, if they need to. Well, and I think that um, your that process of, I think sometimes we can have shame around not being able to access those emotions on the first try. Like I, I know lots of yeah. people who feel shame around this. And I think yeah. what I want people to know or what I believe personally is that you don't need to feel shame about not being able to do it on the first try. You just need to keep trying, right? Um, particularly around race and particularly around, Absolutely. Like, you know, and yeah. I think what, what came up a lot for a lot of white people this summer, you know, was, well, I, I, I'm awakening to, you know, white supremacy in this country. And so I want to read all the books. And right. you know, many, many people who have been in the game a whole lot longer were like, that's cool. But, and obviously I'm a bookseller. And so I believe right. you want them to read the books. Yeah. yeah. I do believe that books can change lives, but I also, yeah. I know many, many folks, you know, who were very wary of that and were like, yeah. y'all just going to read yeah. some books. Like, really? Okay. Um, and I think that that, that's a very legitimate concern, right? Is that as white folks- That can't be where the work stops. Right, and I think a lot of white people still don't know how to move beyond that. And I, what I really like about this mm -hmm. is that you don't say it explicitly. You're not like, here's, here's what you do next, but <laughs> you show how you are just dropping deeper and deeper, you know, throughout the course of, like literally looking at this shameful object, which is this book, that's it's it's almost like a talisman it holds so much power yeah because it's your father because it's this you know this painful history it's all these things but you keep coming back to it and you keep revisiting it and i think that for me came became this sort of like object lesson for what mm -hmm. all white people need to do it's like just keep keep sitting with this this is painful right. keep coming back and right so, right I thought that was really great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had a um, a writer friend who said, she said, I feel like you went into the belly of the beast and came out bloodied to show the rest of us how to do it. And, you know, when she said it, I was like, oh, that's so nice. Like, what a nice thing to say to me. But after sort of digesting that, I thought, yeah, that is, that's how it felt, right? It, it I, I, um, when the book was sort of in production and I knew it was coming out, people would ask how I felt. And I would say, I feel like I'm walking around with my skin on inside out. Um, and that wasn't just about kind of anticipating the exposure of publishing a memoir. It was about um, having done some serious excavating and not quite being um, stitched back together yet. Um, you know, and, and, my hope is that I'm I'm never stitched back together the same way, right? That it that it was a transformative experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience um, from Susan. Susan asks, "The house you grew up in was like a living, breathing character. Can you talk about how <laughs> this often helps heal?" 
Um, I, I can say that I still dream about that house almost every night. I have I wake up with some memory of a dream that, that took place there. So um, so I grew up in this wonderful old house that um, I, I think I don't really know, but I think basically, you know, my father's career did not make him a wealthy man, but he was able to um, buy this house and, and it was kind of our only uh, stability, right? We, we didn't, um, once, once he died, we didn't have much of an income and um, we didn't, there, there wasn't a lot of financial stability, but we had this house and, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure I know how to answer the question except to say that, um, that it was a meaningful place, right? And I, I had a friend in college say to me, I, I'm surprised you didn't move out of it after your father died. And I was like, I don't even understand. That's like, I don't even understand that question. Um, living there was um, as much a, you know, the house was as much of a family member as my mother or my sister and my brother. Um, so yeah, when, when I drive through Northampton now, I, I always drive by it and, and check on it. Um, and yeah, it still absolutely lives in my dreams. So I, I'm sure other people have that about, about the place where they were children, always dreaming about it. That's gotta be a pretty universal thing. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the role of money in this book? Cause I actually think that's a good segue. So, uh, you know, your parents in some ways have this very sort of bohemian cool dream, right? Like they get to write, you know, these, these uh, mass mark. Well, we call them mass market now, but they used to be right. called right. Pulp novels uh, for on spec for cash uh, in the sixties. This very, you know, sort of fun sounding anyway life, at least mm -hmm. at, at first. Um, mm -hmm. And and you sort of dip into that world a little bit, and then um, you. I, I hope you can talk a little bit about the the ebooks and and yeah, of course, and that comes from that because I think one of the things that gets tricky is like. Where, where does money and these these other choices intersect, right? Yep, yep. And I think, um, I, yeah, I absolutely. I think that money and race and shame um, and mental illness, right? All of that, it, it all comes into kind of a knot. Um, so by the time I know I'm writing this book and I'm reading my father's books and I'm trying to figure out who he was and I'm um, having conversations with friends of his to sort of, figure out some of those questions, um, to learn about his life, uh, traveling around the world, writing books on spec. Um, uh, it, it is presented to me from one of these friends as a, as a possibility to republish his old books as eBooks. Um, and in the moment that he's making the suggestion, you know, his, his point is, is, you know, your mother could benefit from this, right? Th these books are just sitting there they've already been written. Um, it doesn't take any work. And my hunch is your mom isn't in a position to turn away free money. Um, you know, not, none of us is, right? But um, but it, it was a it was an idea that really struck me that um, you know, and it was this romantic naive idea that um, my mother, whose finances are um, fixed, right, um, as as many of of her age are right living on social security income basically um that my father could sort of reach out from the other side and and help her out today with um selling his books as ebooks um you know in my defense such as it is there's there's no defense here but um when we were talking about this we weren't specifically talking about a slaver we were talking about a different book that he wrote and i go into the details in in my book um about what happened, but you know, it took some time and some layers of of understanding for me to realize that what was happening was I was putting these horrible slavers back out into the world. You know, and it, it wasn't my name on the contract. And as you say, it was a choice I made um, because of uh, financial insecurity, because of anxiety about um, sort of who my father had been and hope for who he, I could reinvent him to be possibly, you know, it was a very naive uh, decision, but um, you know, I, I got my mom hooked up with the ebook publisher and uh, they, they bought old copies of, of the books on Amazon and, and scanned them. And, and there was a period of time when 
when they were available for sale. Um, you know, and, and I go through all of the ins and outs of this in, in the book, and I don't, I just sort of don't want to ruin for you the story um, and the experience of reading it. But, um, but it was it was the moment that I began once I once I accepted what I had done. It was the moment that I was finally able to see that that my own white privilege, my own sort of naivete um, had more power and control over me than any anti-racist notions I had in my head, right? I, I thought I was just looking out for my mom. It didn't occur to me that um, that the choice that, that I had made here w was hugely damaging. Um, and that here I am telling myself I'm writing a book about race and America, and then I, and then I go along and, and do this thing. So it, um, you know, I, I, I am, I, I narrate the experience of this very much as it's happening, right? I remember one of the chapters that I wrote um, that comes very close to the end. I wrote the day it happened. Um, you, you know, I sort of wrote all of all of these ebook chapters, sort of as they were happening, because it felt like, um, if I was really honest, I could help my my white readers understand how we are complicit in this um, and how we do damage without meaning to right and and again i ha I, I had a, an early draft that a, that a friend of mine read um, we had done a manuscript exchange and she said i think you have two choices you either have to take the ebook piece out or you have to make the whole book about the ebooks and i thought well i i can't do either of those things right um, and so i had to find a way to not let the ebook story like hijack the whole story, but also to not pretend I hadn't done it, right? There, I had this real opportunity to say, listen, white people do stupid shit all the time and we don't even know we're doing it. So here's an example. Here's, here's, here's what I did as, you know, the mother of these children who are now, what, 15 probably and 12 by the time I did this. Um, so yeah. We fuck up all the time. And if we're not um, honest with ourselves and with each other in, in as forgiving a way as we can be, right? That's the, that's Baldwin's definition of love again. Then, um, then we won't, we won't make any progress. We won't make better decisions next time. Yeah. So. I, I really appreciated it and appreciated the blow by blow as it is, because I think that again, it's instructive. And I think it's really helpful because so often I think white authors, even of purportedly anti-racist books, obscure pieces right. of our history, right? right? And it's that that desire always to be the good white person that isn't as bad as other white people, that hasn't done the worst thing, you know? And it's like that 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 really hides a lot of the the things that are the everyday choices, like, yeah. you know, the, the questions around gentrification, the questions around where you choose to, to buy a house or send your children to school or what businesses you support, all these economic things, right. That come yeah. from your, your impulse to protect your mom and, and give mm -hmm. her something and rehabilitate your dad's legacies in your family mm -hmm. is a really relatable, good impulse. Right. And it's like, that's, that's real. Like both things are true, right? And I think, right, right, and it's also right, hugely damaging, right? right. But I, think, <laughs> but it is. You have to hold both. So, so often we get this um, very blunt instrument conversation around white people's complicity and racism of like, well, my heart is pure. I don't, apparently, nobody has a racist bone in their body. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, whatever the, the, that all that dumb kind of basic, yeah. basic discourse around like intent mattering more than impact right yeah. and it's like i do actually think intent matters because we're human and i believe right. intent and in our stories and our understanding it you know yeah we have souls it matters why we do the things that we do and to pretend that it doesn't doesn't actually serve us in our healing but so does so does the the impact and i think right. um, you really you tease that out really well and it's um i think it's going to be really helpful to people kind of trying to to just see like oh this is a concrete example like and it's never too late to to make something to make a different choice because i think right. the other thing we talked just a little bit about before we went on air is like 
so one of the ways that white supremacy works in our culture is around this idea of perfectionism and right. like if you don't get it right on the first try you just you should just hide you should just mm -hmm. like, pretend that nothing happened right and i think the there's a sort of rigor and a sort of work ethic around anti-racist practice and about just okay. being like yes i did this here's how i'm going to do it differently here's how i'm going to make it right and knowing that you can't erase something but you can you can try again and i i really appreciated that and i also i don't know if you want to share what ngoni sort of said about it but i also just appreciated his very like well here you are <laughs> like right kind right of. right and that, that story that i that i tell in the book is when i come home and i just sort of look at him and i say like what do i do like i want him to think of some solution that i haven't thought of and he says listen honey it's pandora's box you opened it. You have to deal with the consequences, right? And that's that's you know again we can talk about the epigraph, right? That's Baldwin's love, right? That like sometimes you fuck up, right? And he he also I, I quote him in the book as saying you know um, people think that we aren't human, right? People think that um, that we all make the right the best decisions all the time, and and that's just no one no one does. And, and you fuck up and I fuck up and you know, we all, we all do it. The question is, what do we do once we've discovered that we have fucked up? And um, yeah, and so I, I'm delighted that you think it would be useful for other readers. I do. Um, so I don't know if folks have questions. I, we definitely welcome questions. Um, the last thing I sort of wanted to talk about was the Ta-Nehisi Coates quote that you kind of return mm -hmm. to around myth making and the American, the role of the dream. basically yeah. the dream yeah. um, and kind of how that, how that functioned in your, in your process. Yeah. Um, you know, Coates has this quote, which I'm going to get wrong because I'm not looking at it right now, but it's about, um, it's about the, this, the, the sort of stories that Americans have told, right? Um, and and the oh, I'm I'm not going to get it right. I don't quite quite remember where it is in the book, but um, you know it, it it's along the lines of um, the dream. The dream is gilded by what is it? Adventure story. The dream is gilded by adventure stories and something else. And you know, and I realize at some point that the dream that he's talking about that is gilded by these stories. You know, my father wrote those stories. Um, uh you know and, and then sort of in that same breath he writes and you know the police reflect america and all of its will and fear and you know and i realized oh oh right the police are a reflection of of my will and fear right and and my father's will and fear and so yeah i i, I sort of come back to that quote several times um yeah, again, you know, I that was a book that I read right at the exact right moment for for the process of, of what I was writing. Um, I was very grateful to him. Well, and I think, you know, so your father was creating one kind of culture and implicitly you're you're trying to create a different kind of culture, right? Mm -hmm. right. And through the same yeah. medium. And I think that's that's something, you know, really powerful that you're sort of reaching um towards one another in 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 this way so i don't know if yeah. you you want to read um yeah the last part but yeah i'll read a little bit from the end um i just think it ties nicely with the theme that we've been talking about and what love is um chapter 52 my feeling is that somebody who writes slavers is not somebody who supports miscegenation laws Ngoni says to me a couple of nights after my return from New York. It's too intimate crafting that kind of a story. My husband and I are perched on kitchen stools with our dinners. The kids in the other room are watching a movie. He's helping me categorize the different interpretations of my father, his career, his illness, which begat what. I've just expressed my frustration that I can't find the key that will reveal why my dad could do what he did when he sat at his desk. How someone with his politics, he was liberal, supported the civil rights movement, took pride in the fact that he and my mom lived in Mickey Schwerner's old apartment in Brooklyn, could write books so rooted in stereotype anyway. 
I know as I talk about all of this that I'm steering us away from the topic of dad's depression, that I'm making a choice not to tell Ngoni what my brother thinks killed our father. I've just come back from a visit with my brother. Maybe I'm worried it will remind him of his own father or of, or of his uncle, who's finally got a handle on his demons thanks to the right medications. Maybe I can't bring it all into one room right now. It's too much to bear with the kids just down the hall. Or maybe it's just still too raw after our fight a few nights ago, our first in a long time. It was about when we should tell the kids about their grandfather's illnesses, about their possible inheritances, when we should tell them what the signs are and how to look for them. It's rare for me and Ngoni to disagree on how to parent these kids but we disagree on this. So after leaving it unresolved a few nights ago, I'm not eager to return to the topic just yet. We won't solve this one so simply. So I'm making us talk instead about dad's books, about his career. I know that some people think your father's career was scandalous, he says, but for me, the scandal is the least interesting piece of it. He stops talking for a moment, collects his thoughts, it's really important to know where you come from, even when the story might not be pleasant. The room shifts. When I first visited the house on State Street soon after we met to meet your mom, I felt this huge absence, not your missing father, but the absence of grief, he says. You hadn't mourned him, I could tell, so no one could face the fact that he had existed and shaped who you were and the fabric of the family. But what I never understood was that it felt like an intentional absence. I hadn't thought about that before, that after an intentional death came an intentional absence. I've thought about how we each mourned my father independently, how his suicide fractured the family into individual parts, how my mother's emotional reserve might have influenced how free I felt to bring him up when I needed to. But I chalked all that up to her waspy upbringing, to her Protestant beginnings. I haven't thought before about how much work she put into pretending she didn't need him after he died or how that was a model I followed. If you fundamentally believe, as I do, that the world of the living is intimately connected to the world of the dead, Ngoni says, then you've got to give the dead permission to rest. In Zimbabwe, the Shona ritualize mourning for just this reason. Another way we do it is naming. Naming George after your father helped your dad know he had permission to rest. I nod my head because I want him to keep talking, but I'm not sure I fully follow him. I don't fundamentally believe that the world of the living and the world of the dead are intertwined. I don't believe in an afterlife or that there's a higher power looking after us all in this one, or that the dead have feelings that are influenced by decisions made by the living. But there's something in Ngoni's belief system I want to grab onto, something that soothes me and allows me to think it might be possible to believe more than one thing. And while I wasn't raised with it, the fact is that Jews also ritualize mourning, also honor the dead with names. When my husband talks this way, I don't not believe. One morning last winter, after Julius walked down the hill to the school bus, and while George still slept in his bed, his bus comes later. I strapped snowshoes to my boots and headed into the woods with the dog for our morning hike. It took me a moment to realize that something was different this morning, that this morning's hike didn't feel like any of the ones before. It took me a moment to realize that Dad was there in the woods with me that day. The air felt heavier, I think. So I talked to him a little, said I was glad he'd come. But mostly we just enjoyed the winter quiet. When I came to the clearing that leads back to the house, I figured he would follow me home, but he didn't. After I woke George up and scrambled him some eggs, after I packed his snack and told him to put on his boots, I looked out the window 
and felt my dad out there, hovering around the orange Adirondack chairs, snow all around. Sometimes it feels like we made our home in this place by these woods to give my father that, I say to Ngoni in the kitchen that night, to give him a place to rest. Sometimes I think that's what this whole life is. These days, standing at the stove next to Ngoni, laughing while we make the chili, I picture dad stooped on a stool behind us, laughing too. Sometimes, when I feel the kettle in the darkness of an early morning while Ngoni irons his shirt, I picture dad's handwriting on a note attached to a newspaper clipping he wants my husband to read and which he left on the counter for him to find. Sometimes, sitting in the passenger seat of Ngoni's car as we drive by the hospital where he died on our way to a soccer tournament, the kids singing or laughing or fighting in the back seat. I picture dad holding a worn lawn chair under his arm in the parking lot when we arrive. I've just come to watch the boys games, he'll say when we smile at his appearance. I wanted to surprise you. And he hugs me before we line up our chairs in a row and sit together. My sons warming up and showing off with shots on goal turning to see if he's watching, my sons calling out his name. His first wife told me that day in Vermont that he would have, a bit, have, would have been a good grandfather to my sons. Sometimes I believe her. It's retro causality, letting the present affect the past. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was lovely. Um, well, is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't get to talk about yet? <laughs> I no. I'd love if there are questions from the audience. I would answer them. Or yeah. um, that might have just been enough. We've been here a while, huh? Susan followed <laughs> up by saying that she appreciated how much uh, your husband's wisdom that you thought he'd react a certain way and then he'd say something so profound. So mm. that was nice. Um, He's a good one. Sounds like it. <laughs> like, very solid, solid person. Yeah. Uh, well, I would love for everyone to, if you do not yet own the bookkeeper, click this teal button at the bottom of the screen. Um, it is, I think, an excellent book to give lots of people. Um, <laughs> I do think it would be a good gift for many family members. It would probably open a lot of really good family conversations. So consider giving it as a gift for the holidays. Um, and uh, is there where where can folks follow you? Do you do social media, Julia? Do you I, I do a little bit. I have a very limited presence on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook is my, my sort of bigger one. Um, but yeah, I'm on all those places. Okay. Julia Munemo is probably all you need. There aren't very many Munemos in Oh, there are more Munemos in Zimbabwe. In, in the U.S., there's just us. All right, great. Um, so follow Julia. And um, the last thing it's my job to do is um, let you know that, you know, we are primarily individually donor sponsored. So if folks have uh, $1, $5, $10 to support our nonprofit, Kara Sir, thank you, everybody who joined us tonight. Julia, this was lovely. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This was this was really great. This is my my last sort of public event and what a what a great one. This has been a true highlight of my virtual book tour. My Thank pleasure. you, ER. And yeah. Stay in touch and uh, I hope that you'll write some more books. <laughs> Thank you. Get Thanks break. everybody for coming. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night. <laughs>